Hi there, I'm Sean Dillman. Welcome to the Legal Assistant Tech Course. My goal in presenting to you is to show you simple, innovative, and immediately applicable ways to use everyday hardware and software to help you manage your legal work and get things done more quickly and with greater accuracy. By taking this course, I hope that you'll be able to do some or all of the following. Earn more money, save more time, suffer less stress, have happier clients, produce better work, earn professional credit, and build stronger organizations. Please note that the target audience of this course is the average computer user, so no specialized knowledge is needed on your end. Also, this course is designed for both Windows users and Mac users, and the things I'll be discussing will apply to both platforms. The demonstrations will be done on computers running Windows and smartphones running Android, but if you need any help translating these lessons to Apple products, please just get in touch with me. Further, please note that this course is accredited for continuing professional development credit in relation to topics of professionalism, meaning those which address professional responsibility, ethics, and or practice management. If you're subject to professional development requirements, this course is a great way to get hours of credit which meet these specific requirements. If you're not subject to professional development requirements or you already have your hours for the year, then you're all set. Before I continue, I'll tell you a bit about myself and explain why what I have to say is important for you. I went from graduating law school, being called to the bar, and opening a law firm with a partner, all in under three years' time. In that short period, I progressed through the stages of being a law student, being an articled student, being a junior lawyer with no assistant, being a mid-level associate with an assistant, and finally, being a managing partner of a law firm with multiple staff. It took a lot of work to get through these stages, and as I advanced through each, I encountered challenges which caused me to change how I approach and manage my work. Before I began my career in law, I studied computers at college and worked as a web developer and a computer technician for IBM. Because of my background in information technology, it was natural for me to seek solutions based on computer hardware and software. So what's the point? Why am I telling you this? I'm telling you this because I've been through adversity, and when I was faced with these challenges, I learned to improve. I had to work smarter, not only harder, by developing and refining different techniques and practices. These techniques and practices are what I'll be sharing with you in this course. Here's how I'll be doing it. In the first part of the course, the computer hardware module, I'll provide you with different options for how you can use everyday IT equipment to make drastic improvements to how you do your work. We'll be looking at all of the physical hardware that I recommend, most of which I use every day. In the second part of the course, the computer software module, I'll be showing you practical ways to use common pieces of technology to improve how you accomplish specific goals and tasks. In each lesson, I'll follow the same simple structure. First, I'll introduce each piece of hardware or software. Then I'll consider the problems I'm solving by using it. Finally, I'll discuss why you should be using it too, how it can benefit you, and how you can get started. You may find that you're already using some of the pieces of my system in your own, but you may not be using every piece, or you may not be using each piece to its full potential. I attribute my success to using many different solutions together. In addition to using these solutions to benefit myself personally, I also put many of the solutions in place in my office to benefit my collective organization. Before I developed this course, I was talking with a staff member at my firm about one of the hardware solutions which I had put into place. She told me that it was new to her and very helpful. She said, and I quote, I didn't know that I needed it until I had it. The way she put it really struck me. Before working with me, she had been working in offices for decades, and yet I was able to introduce something to her which she hadn't been using, which had now revolutionized how she worked. It switched on a light bulb for her. My goal in producing this course is to switch on light bulbs for you too. I don't want you to go years without knowing about simple things that you could have been doing with everyday computer technology to increase your success by improving your performance. Right now, I want to give you the benefit of my innovative techniques, which are designed to solve many common problems, and the years of thought and development that I've put into improving how I control and manage my work. By design, many of the lessons in this course involve making small and simple changes. In my experience, small changes work. If you can save yourself 30 seconds here and 30 seconds there, it's like compound interest. It adds up across your day, which adds up across your week, which adds up across your month, and then across your entire year. If you can save yourself time every time you open a web browser or write an email, it saves you time, and this time is like an investment in your life. Continually seeking better ways of doing things is a passion for me, and is something that's helped me be a successful lawyer. I want you to benefit from the lessons of this course and be successful in your career too. 
They don't teach these lessons in school, and you won't find this information anywhere else. With these goals in mind, thank you for your attention. I'm excited to be sharing with you, so let's get started. This module of the course covers computer hardware. When I talk about computer hardware, I mean it in a very expansive way. Computer hardware encompasses all of the physical things that relate to information technology that are used in an office, whether it be a traditional brick and mortar office or a remote home office. As one would expect, this includes computer equipment, such as computers, mice, monitors, keyboards, speakers, microphones, and fingerprint readers. This also includes other equipment, such as printers, scanners, fax machines, telephones, smartphones, headsets, and other equipment. Further, furniture such as desks, chairs, mounting equipment, and mats is also included in my definition of hardware. By way of disclaimer, please note that I'm not your physician or personal IT consultant. I make no specific guarantees as to the efficacy, results, or outcomes of taking this course or implementing any of the suggestions. You are solely responsible for achieving your desired outcome. Some of the suggestions that I'll be making in this course involve using physical pieces of equipment. Before you implement any changes, I suggest that you consult with a physician as may be appropriate to ensure that you don't cause or exacerbate any injury. With that being said, let's continue and move into the computer hardware module. Desks are where most legal assistants and paralegals do most of their work. A standing desk is a desk which is designed to be used in an upright standing position. There are many different kinds of standing desks designed to fit different needs. In this lesson, I'll be giving you an introduction to standing desks and providing different options to suit different needs and budgets. How many times a day do you sit at a desk? It may be the first thing that you do each morning and be something that you spend many hours doing throughout the day. What would happen if the time you spent sitting was replaced with standing or a mix of sitting and standing? You'd likely start to see benefits to your health, energy, and productivity. Getting started with a standing desk can be relatively easy or somewhat difficult depending on your workspace. One simple way to get started is to simply stack books or boxes on your desk to produce a makeshift standing desk. This is what I did when I was a student. I used spare books and boxes to make platforms for my monitors, keyboard, and mouse. Although it was very low tech, this method was also very simple and just fine for my home office that was mostly only seen by me. If you'd like to go this route but want something a bit more custom, companies like Refold offer standing desks which are made out of cardboard and can be used either on top of a desk or standing on the floor. If you want a more custom configuration, you'll either need to buy and install a workstation or use stands at your existing desk for your monitors, keyboard, and mouse. My standing desk setup combines a traditional desk with mounts, which attach my monitors to the wall, and arms, which are attached to my desk and suspend my keyboard, mouse, and office telephone above my desk. This configuration allows me to set the height and location of each piece of equipment and results in a cleaner desk with more usable space. Also, I keep my computer on my desk instead of under my desk where computers are usually kept. This makes it easier for me to connect my monitors, keyboard, and mouse. Keeping my computer on my desk also helps keep it cleaner and free of fan clogging dust bunnies, which can cause computers to overheat and malfunction. If you regularly meet or work with other people at your desk, you may want a sit-stand desk, like the kind made by Ergotron. A sit-stand desk can be used either in a sitting or standing position. This can be useful so that you can stand when working alone and sit when other people are at your desk. At the touch of a button, you can raise your desk so that you can stand at it or lower it so that you can sit at it by yourself or with other people. In general, sit-stand desks are more versatile and make for an easier transition to using a standing desk if you've never used one before. For me, the process of becoming accustomed to a standing desk took many months. I went through different stages of experiencing discomfort in my feet, hips, knees, and legs. Eventually, when I became accustomed to it, I felt fine and built up the tolerance to stand all day. Although I recommend using a standing desk, 
It may not be for everyone, and I make no guarantees about any risks or benefits. When using a standing desk, it's important to observe good posture and proper positioning with keyboards, mice, and screens to avoid strain on the wrists, neck, and back. If you're trying to become accustomed to using a standing desk, you may want to try using an anti-fatigue mat, shoe inserts, or both to help reduce aches and pains. These can make it easier to stand for longer periods of time. Once you become accustomed to standing, you may even want to take things to the next level and use fitness equipment, such as a balance board, balance ball, or stability disc. I use a balance board at my standing desk and find that it challenges my ability to stabilize while adding a little bit of fun to standing. Over many years of using a standing desk, I've definitely burned more calories standing than I would have if I was sitting, and I believe that this has had a positive effect on my health. If you've never used a standing desk before, I hope that I've provided you with some different options for how you can try one. If you're already using a standing desk, I hope that I've given you some ideas about different things you can try to make your experience even better. No matter your budget or the size of your working space, there are many different options that you can explore right now. In my experience, using a standing desk improves posture, health, energy, and productivity. I find that these benefits make it easier to manage my work more effectively. By using my suggestions about standing desks, I hope that you'll be able to manage your work more effectively too. Along with a mouse, one of the main ways that we interact with computers is through a keyboard. This lesson is about using an ergonomic keyboard to improve typing technique and wrist positioning. If you haven't seen an ergonomic keyboard before, they are the curved keyboards which look like this. They're designed to increase efficiency and comfort by minimizing muscle strain and addressing typing related deficiencies. How many times a day do you use a keyboard? It's likely one of the first things you do when you use a computer and you likely use it many times every day. How long do you spend typing each day? Depending on your workload, you may spend a few short hours or many long hours typing each day. What would happen if you could quickly improve your wrist positioning and typing technique? You'd likely type faster, with greater accuracy, fewer typos, and less wrist pain or injury. Using an ergonomic keyboard made a big difference on my typing technique. When I started using one, it helped me discover a problem that I didn't know about. At that point, I'd only been using traditional keyboards, and I didn't realize that when I was typing, I was reaching across the keyboard with my right hand to type keys that are to be typed with the left hand, and vice versa. When I started using an ergonomic keyboard, the curved design and increased distance between the left hand keys and right hand keys made me realize my error and caused me to correct it. The greater distance between the keys forced me to stop reaching across with the wrong fingers and helped me correct a problem which I didn't even know I had. This small change caused a big improvement in my typing speed and accuracy. Using an ergonomic keyboard also helped me become more alert to the importance of using proper posture and hand positioning while typing. When typing, your elbows should generally be in an open angle and your shoulders and forearms should be relaxed. The keyboard should be flat or even sloping slightly away from you. Certain types of mounting equipment, such as the kind offered by Ergotron, make it easier to control the forward and backward tilt of your keyboard. Your wrist should be kept straight, not flexed downwards or upwards. Finally, your wrist should not rest on any surface while typing, as this can put pressure on tendons and reduce blood circulation. Getting started with an ergonomic keyboard is relatively easy. There are many different manufacturers and models to choose from. The easiest way to start is to try some at a local computer shop that has some on display. Using an ergonomic keyboard may initially feel awkward, but the feeling will eventually pass as it becomes more comfortable and familiar. For all of the use that keyboards experience, they offer exceptional value and are relatively inexpensive. They're also easy to install and don't require any special hardware or software. They typically connect by USB cable, wireless USB, or Bluetooth. If you've never used an ergonomic keyboard before, I hope that you'll consider giving one a try. If you're already using an ergonomic keyboard, I hope that this lesson has inspired you to give your form and technique a checkup. For me, being able to type faster and with greater accuracy comes in very handy. It means being able to do my work more quickly and with greater accuracy. I hope that by using an ergonomic keyboard, you can enjoy these benefits too.
Along with a keyboard, one of the main ways that we interact with computers is through a mouse. A performance mouse offers features that go beyond what a traditional mouse offers, more than just moving and controlling the cursor. It has advanced features which are designed to improve efficiency and help with completing common tasks. This lesson is about getting the most out of your time by using a performance mouse. How many times a day do you use a mouse? It's probably one of the first things that you do when you use your computer. How long do you spend using your mouse during the day? You likely use it often and repeatedly. What would happen if you had a better mouse that had a more ergonomic design and more features? You'd likely experience more efficient use and reduce your risk of developing a wrist injury. Mouse technology has advanced significantly in recent years. In terms of connectivity, mice can still connect by cables, but they can also connect wirelessly by USB or Bluetooth. Most performance mice are plug and play, meaning all you need to do is connect it to your computer and it works. You don't need any special hardware or software. You may want to use special software to configure functions which I'll be discussing, but this software will come with the mouse, be available for download on the manufacturer's website, or both. In terms of cursor control and tracking, mice have advanced from LED tracking to laser tracking. The benefit to you is that a performance mouse can track on almost any surface, including clear glass, making it unnecessary to avoid shiny surfaces or use a mouse pad in most situations. In terms of ergonomics, mice have become more comfortable and better designed. Certain models of performance mice, such as the one from the Logitech MX series, are specifically designed to decrease wrist pressure, reduce muscle strain, and improve posture. This can prevent wrist injuries and help people recover if they already have such an injury. In terms of scrolling, performance mice feature advanced speed adaptive technology, which adjusts the speed of the wheel as you scroll. As you scroll the wheel, a subtle clicking sound comes from it. As you scroll more and more, the wheel switches to a silent, free spin mode, which causes extremely quick scrolling. This makes it faster and easier to scroll long documents, websites, and folders. In terms of battery life, many performance mice are rechargeable, which means no more buying or changing batteries. My mouse goes many months on a single charge, even though I use it frequently every day. It's probably paid for itself in the time and money that I've saved in not having to buy and replace batteries over many years. In terms of buttons, performance mice generally have more buttons than a traditional mouse, which usually only has two, the left and right click buttons. The additional buttons on a performance mouse are useful for navigating documents and web pages. They can be programmed for different functions, including launching frequently used applications. For example, like me, you likely use Google on a regular basis to look things up or ask questions. To make this everyday task even easier, I programmed the button on the top of my mouse to open my web browser. Whenever I want to use Google, I simply press the top button and Google automatically opens in my web browser. Before I had this button, I had to launch Google by clicking an icon in the toolbar or on my desktop. By making the process faster, I save time every day. My mouse also has dedicated buttons for forward and backward navigation. This is useful for navigating operating system folders or web pages and eliminates the need to drag the cursor up to the forward and back buttons. Over the course of days, weeks, months, and years, these time savings add up. Since upgrading to a performance mouse, I've saved huge amounts of time by not needing to click the forward and back buttons. Like ergonomic keyboards, performance mice offer exceptional value. They experience heavy use, but they're relatively inexpensive. The one that I use, the Logitech MX Master, cost around $100 and has been serving me well for years. It can even connect wirelessly to up to three computers. I can use it with my desktop computer, and then at the touch of a button, switch over to using it with my laptop. This feature saves me the cost and inconvenience of having multiple mice, one for each computer. I even purchased a dedicated protective case to keep my performance mouse secure for when I carry it outside of the office. If you aren't using a performance mouse, I highly recommend that you start now. They are extremely durable, dependable, and easy to use. Getting started is simple, and there are many different makes and models to choose from. As with ergonomic keyboards, the easiest way to start is to try one at a nearby computer shop. For my money, I recommend something from the Logitech MX series. No matter where you are in your career, I strongly believe that you could benefit from using a performance mouse today. I use mine often every day and enjoy the benefits. I highly recommend upgrading to a performance mouse so that you can enjoy the benefits too.
Computer monitors are the visual displays that we use to see our work on our computers. Whereas keyboards and mice allow us to input information and commands into the computer, monitors allow the computer to output information back to us. By using multiple monitors on a single computer, it's possible to see more information at once and work more efficiently. In this lesson, I'll be discussing my best practices for using multiple monitors. How often do you use a monitor? You likely use a monitor whenever you use a computer. When using a monitor, how often do you switch between different applications? If you're using only one monitor, you likely switch between different applications very often, possibly many times each minute. What would happen if you could see multiple applications simultaneously and spend less time switching between them? You'd have more time to focus on what you're working on and get things done faster, more efficiently, and with greater accuracy. Using multiple monitors clearly improves productivity. It's like working on a bigger desk. By using multiple monitors, you can leave applications open and not waste time uncovering them again. Conversely, using only one monitor is like using a tiny desk. Although you can leave multiple applications open, they may be stacked on one another, and you may need to waste time searching for them and switching between them. Using multiple monitors makes it possible to see multiple applications simultaneously. Having dedicated monitors for specific applications can be particularly efficient. This is how I configure my monitors. I use three monitors which are separated into five sections. My main monitor is a widescreen display which I've rotated 90 degrees and set to portrait orientation. This means it's taller top to bottom and shorter across the middle. By configuring my monitor in this way, I can fit full pages on my screen. I don't need to scroll up and down. I can see a full page letter or legal size document at a standard 100% zoom size. My second monitor is a large flat screen TV in landscape orientation, which is divided into three sections. I use each section for a specific function. One section is for my calendar, one section is for my email, and one section is for my file navigator. By using a dedicated screen for each of these functions, I save huge amounts of time. I just leave my applications running. I don't need to start them and stop them. I don't need to move applications around or search through them to find something that I'm looking for. My calendar, email, and file navigator are always open in their own screens and ready to use. My third monitor is a smaller widescreen in landscape orientation, which is set below my flat screen TV. The size and shape of this monitor makes it perfect for spreadsheets and other office specific software. While this configuration works for me, it may not work for you. Each person needs to find their own system. You may prefer fewer monitors. You may prefer more monitors. You may prefer to put the monitors in different locations. A monitor configuration should be as individual as the person using it. In general, my advice is that you should use at least two monitors and use additional ones if it makes sense for you, given whatever constraints you have on cost, space, and computer hardware. When using multiple monitors, it's important to carefully consider where each monitor will be placed relative to your primary monitor, the one that you'll be using the most. The monitors need to be in positions that don't cause neck pain or eye strain, even with prolonged use. The easiest way to observe proper neck and head posturing is to position monitors so that using them feels natural. They shouldn't be too high or too low, or too far to the left or right. In general, you should be aiming to view the middle of the monitor with your eyes looking slightly downward. Your monitor should be about an arm's length away from your eyes, and the larger the monitor, the further away it should be. Monitors should also be adjusted to reduce any glare coming from nearby lights or windows. Please keep in mind that using multiple monitors requires a certain minimum of physical space and effort to install. You'll need to use brackets to mount monitors on arms, posts, walls, or on a standing workstation if you have one. If you need somewhere to start, I recommend looking into the different options offered by Ergotron. Using multiple monitors also requires a computer which supports multiple video outputs. Most new computers support two monitors without needing any special hardware. If you want to use three or more monitors, your computer will need a video card that can support the connections. You'll also need the right kinds of cables to connect your monitors to your computer. Common video cable standards include DVI, VGA, HDMI, and DisplayPort. Beware that you may need cables that mix the standards on the two ends of the cable. If you need some help finding the right cables, a simple method is to use a smartphone to take photos of the connectors on your computer and monitors and take those photos to a computer shop. The person at the shop should be able to identify the kinds of cables you need and help ensure that you purchase cables that are long enough to reach from your monitors to your computer. Finally, you may want to use custom software to manage your monitors. Most operating systems support the management of multiple monitors, 
but specialized software can help with controlling, orienting, and positioning sections in the monitors. I use a piece of powerful multi-monitor software called Display Fusion, which allows me to set the orientation of the displays in my monitors and divide my flat screen TV into separate sections. Because large flat screen TVs are more available and affordable than ever, for many people, simply using one large TV and dividing it into multiple sections with Display Fusion may be the easiest way to achieve the effect of using multiple monitors. If you're interested in purchasing Display Fusion, please get in touch with me for more information and a special referral code. If you're not using multiple monitors, I highly recommend that you follow my suggestions on how to upgrade your system. If you are using multiple monitors, I hope that I've given you some ideas about better ways that you can use them and how you could add even more monitors to your system. The investment of time, money, and equipment will be worth it as it's more efficient to keep applications open rather than closing them, reopening them, and moving them around. More generally, using multiple monitors frees up scarce space on your desk, makes for a cleaner workspace, and gives a big boost to productivity. A desktop scanner is a small piece of hardware that can have a big impact on your ability to manage information and workload. By scanning documents, desktop scanners bring paper documents into the digital world so that they can be worked on more quickly and easily. In this lesson, I'll be sharing my best practices for using desktop scanners to help with doing legal work. How many times a day do you work with paper documents? If you're like me, you work with paper regularly and find that no matter how much the world is trending towards going paperless, that paper documents are still necessary and used heavily. How often do you wish that you had a paper document in an electronic format so that you could copy and paste data from it or otherwise manipulate it? This may happen every time you work with a paper document. What would happen if you could quickly and easily digitize documents at your desk? You'd likely be able to work faster, maintain a cleaner workspace, and have secure and more organized documents. To manage and create digital copies of paper documents, Many people use software, such as Adobe Acrobat, to view, create, and manage PDF files. The acronym PDF means Portable Document Format. The PDF file format is extremely versatile and probably the best one for reproducing documents in digital form. The easiest way to produce a PDF from a paper document is to use a multi-page document feed scanner, such as a desktop scanner. Flatbed scanners can also be used to scan documents and create PDFs, but they're slower than multi-page feed scanners and can only scan one page at a time. They are, however, useful for scanning certain types of documents which can't be scanned using a multi-page scanner. This includes documents that are made out of hard plastic like IDs or credit cards, are of an unusually large size like posters or engineering plans, or are bound and not loose leaf, such as books or passports. For all other kinds of loose leaf documents, which are letter, legal, or smaller sized, including business cards and receipts, desktop scanners are extremely useful. When working with these kinds of documents, there are many advantages to using a desktop scanner. Desktop scanners save time in many ways. It typically takes only a few seconds to scan a page, and many scanners will scan both sides of a document simultaneously so that the whole page is captured in a single scan, front and back. Once a document is scanned, it can be used on a computer quickly and easily. Digital documents offer many advantages in terms of accessibility and functionality. It's easier to view, store, edit, combine, share, sign, and redact digital documents than physical documents. In terms of physical dimensions, desktop scanners take up little desk space. They also reduce paper clutter, make for a cleaner working environment, and increase the physical space that's available in a workspace by reducing the need to store paper. Desktop scanners also offer advantages around security. The risks associated with keeping loose paper documents are reduced, when documents are scanned into password-protected computer systems. Once documents are scanned, originals can be stored or destroyed, depending on the document, and work can proceed using the original version. Desktop scanners are relatively inexpensive and may even pay for themselves in terms of the benefits that they offer by being portable. On many occasions, I've taken my portable desktop scanner and laptop to a courthouse library to scan public records and reference materials for free. Without a desktop scanner, I'd either need to pay to make photocopies or use a smartphone to take photos of the pages. While this can be helpful if these are the only available options, in terms of cost and quality, photocopies or photographs can't compare to high-quality scanned images. 
Getting started with a desktop scanner is relatively easy. You'll need the following. First, you'll need a desktop scanner unit. Many different makes and models are available, which vary in terms of size, price, quality, and speed. If you're looking for somewhere to start, I recommend looking at scanners made by Fujitsu. Second, you'll need physical space on your desk. Fortunately, desktop scanners are relatively small and don't need much space. If you have the room and can budget in some additional space, it's helpful to elevate the scanner and place a paper tray below it to catch documents after they're scanned. If possible, you may wish to try putting your scanner on the back of a small laser printer. The built-in tray on the printer which catches paper after it's printed also doubles as the tray which catches paper after it's scanned. Third, you'll need standard computer hardware. Desktop scanners connect to computers by wired or wireless connection. Once your scanner is connected, you'll need a hard drive which is large enough to hold your scanned documents. Alternately, you may want to configure your scanner to save documents to a public directory on a network so that other people can access and use the documents that you're scanning. Fourth and last, you'll need computer software. Desktop scanners will come with software or it will be available for download on the manufacturer's website. Depending on the scanner and software, many different custom settings will be available to control things such as the location of where the document is saved on your computer or network, the scan image quality, color, and compression, whether documents are scanned single or double-sided, whether documents feed into the scanner face up or face down, the file format the scanned document will be created in, I recommend using PDF format, whether the scanner will automatically run optical character recognition or OCR on the document as it's scanned, and whether the scanner automatically detects the size of the paper being scanned. For most people, the default settings will work well enough. However, making custom changes can make the scanner work even better for your specific needs. If you have any questions about changing the custom settings, I suggest that you confer with your IT person if you have one, or contact me directly. When used in an office, desktop scanners can be used as part of an office-wide digital document policy. My best practices for how offices should be scanning documents are as follows. Documents should be scanned immediately when they come in by mail, in person, or by delivery. Before any files are archived or destroyed, a complete scanned copy should be made and saved in an appropriate folder. Once documents are scanned, text recognition software should be run on them so that they're smaller in size and it's possible to copy and paste and search the contents of the document from the operating system. Specific file and folder naming conventions should be used so that everyone will know what file name to give each document and where to put each file in the system. By maintaining these policies, you can have complete confidence in your digital document system. You'll be able to rely on your documents always being complete, you'll always know where your documents are, and you and your staff will be able to work on the documents from your own individual computers. If everything happens and is in place before you sit down to do your work, you'll be saving time and money. This is another small change that can have a big impact. In my experience, desktop scanners are very powerful pieces of equipment. Despite the hype about going paperless, paper continues to be used for many different functions and must be managed and stored. By scanning documents as much as possible, the world of paper is brought into the world of computers, where all of the various benefits I've been discussing are available. I highly recommend that you use a desktop scanner so that you can enjoy the same benefits too. Smartphones can be very powerful tools when used to manage legal work. A smartphone is a mobile phone that performs many of the functions of a conventional computer. It typically has standard features such as a touchscreen, camera, speakers, and a software operating system capable of running applications which are called apps. In this lesson, I'll be discussing my best practices for using a smartphone in legal practice. How many times a day are you away from your computer and want to check your email or calendar? If you're like me, this likely happens many times each day. What would happen if you had greater access to these resources? You could always know what's in your calendar and review and respond to email from anywhere and at any time. You could also have more timely and effective communications and be more organized with tasks, meetings, and reminders. According to a recent survey, more than half of the people in the world have smartphones. Some of the greatest strengths of smartphones include them being reasonably affordable, highly portable, and capable of running many different apps which achieve different goals. The apps that I find to be the most useful fall into the following categories. 
Different apps for managing email and calendars come preloaded on smartphones and can be downloaded. I find it helpful to be able to check my email, calendar, and messages wherever I am when I'm on the go. I sometimes receive time-sensitive emails and messages, and it's helpful for me to be able to respond. For responding with a short message, I find that I save huge amounts of time by composing using the speech-to-text feature on my phone, though I always double-check what I'm sending before I send it. For full-length emails and drafting, I wait until I'm at my computer. Many different apps are available for viewing images and taking pictures and video. Since I started using a smartphone, I found that there are any number of productive ways to use images. For example, I've taken photos of books or other materials so that I could remember them later. I've taken photos of people's IDs and documents when I've seen clients out of the office. I've made instructional videos of processes for staff to watch and follow. A picture is worth a thousand words, and the list of uses for images and videos goes on and on. Voice recorder apps come standard with smartphones. They can be useful for making voice notes and recording meetings, assuming that the people being recorded have given their consent. I often record short voice notes for myself when I want to get ideas out. To get the recording file off of my phone and onto my computer, I find that the easiest way is to simply send it to myself by email as an attachment. By making recordings in this way, I can deal with thoughts when they come up, keep my mind clear, and ensure that I don't forget important things. I also send myself short email messages using the speech-to-text feature. In certain circumstances, text and instant messaging can be very useful to get work done. In my practice, I generally didn't allow clients to have my phone number, but sometimes I'd share it in situations that required quick communications, such as those involving court hearings. In an office setting, it's helpful to have everyone's phone number and occasionally text message with staff during or outside of business hours. This can be particularly helpful if people need to advise that they're sick or have an appointment and won't be able to make it into work. For the capabilities that they offer, smartphones are relatively inexpensive. They work best when they have internet access, either by Wi-Fi or cellular, so that they can stay connected and remain synced with your data, particularly your email and calendars. Although I enjoy many benefits by using my smartphone to do work, I put specific rules in place to ensure that I'm not being distracted, working too much, or doing work on my phone that would be better done on my computer. For many of us, setting boundaries is an important way to prevent us from working 24-7 and being distracted. These are the rules that I follow. I check my phone throughout the workday, but not on evenings or weekends, except for Sunday evenings when I check to see what I'll be doing in the upcoming week. Outside of office hours, I set my phone to airplane mode so that I can still use many of the features of my phone, but not receive outside notifications. When I take my phone off of airplane mode at the start of business days, voicemail and message notifications come in, and I deal with them one by one with my computer and files available so that I can make notes and refer to materials as necessary. Further, I keep my phone on silent mode at all times. I don't want to be distracted by noises alerting me to calls, messages, or emails as they come in, and I don't want my phone to ring during meetings. Because I check my phone often throughout the day, I don't need to be notified of calls, messages, and email notifications. By keeping my phone on silent mode and checking it at free times during the day, I prevent the time savings I enjoy by using a smartphone from being eliminated by being continually interrupted. Finally, to ensure that I'm not being distracted by games or social media, I simply don't load those apps on my phone. As smartphones continue to advance, they'll continue to offer new tools which can be used to help get work done quicker and easier. In their current forms, smartphones are incredibly useful for managing email, scheduling meetings, setting reminders, making audio recordings, taking pictures and video, and communicating with people by phone and text message. If you don't have a smartphone or don't use one as part of your work, you may want to consider some of the ways that using one could benefit you and help you adapt and keep current with changing techniques and practices. If you are using a smartphone as part of your work, I recommend that you consider how you could use it differently to better help you. The way that I use my smartphone may not be for everyone. However, the goals that I'm seeking to achieve do apply to everyone. Namely, improving access and capabilities while mitigating distraction. A headset is a set of headphones, typically with a microphone attached. They come in a variety of models and styles. There are wired headsets and wireless headsets. 
ones with and without microphones, some that fit around the ear, and some that are earbuds, which fit inside of the ear. Headsets come in different colors and may have buttons to control volume, call answering, and other functions, including noise cancellation. Whatever specific need you may have, there is likely a perfect headset available for you. In this lesson, I'll be discussing ways that you can use headsets to improve how you approach your work. How many calls do you take in a day? If you're like me, you may be taking anywhere from a few to a few dozen or more. How often do you take notes during calls, and would it be helpful to have your hands free to type or write? Depending on your practices, you may like to make at least some notes for every call and find it helpful to have your hands free so that you can write or type. How often do you need to listen to something private, such as your voicemail or a voice recording? Depending on your workspace and how often you're in public, this need may arise often and sometimes be difficult to manage. What would happen if your hands were free for calls and you could always have a private way of listening to audio? You could take better notes during your calls and listen to audio privately at any time. Headsets are relatively inexpensive and are easy to use. They generally don't require any special equipment or setup. They offer versatility and can be used to achieve many different tasks, such as making phone calls and listening to voicemail, reviewing voice recordings, listening to podcasts and educational materials, reviewing documents with text-to-speech, and dictating memos, notes, and emails using speech-to-text. Headsets also generally make for higher audio quality calls. In the case of headsets which come with microphones, the microphone is generally close to the mouth, which means that you don't need to talk as loudly, and the person on the other end of the call will ideally be able to hear you better. When used for the purposes of studying and memorizing information, headsets can be very useful. I graduated undergrad summa cum laude in the top 3% of my school. I used many different techniques to be a good student, and one of which involved using a headset. Before each semester began, I requested copies of the course syllabuses from my professors and then found or made audio copies of the materials that would be studied. When I rode the bus or went for a walk, I'd listen to the materials. By the time each semester started, I'd already listened to the course materials, sometimes multiple times. When it came time to answer questions in class and write exams, I generally knew where everything was in the materials and could often provide direct quotes. During law school, I used the same technique to listen to outlines and my class notes in preparation for exams. I also used this technique to study for the bar exam. I listened to most of the materials while running on a treadmill at the gym. This approach can be particularly useful if you need to retain and later recall information or give a speech or presentation or appear and speak in a formal setting. Starting with a headset is very easy and is simply a matter of finding the right one or ones for your needs. If you have devices that can communicate by Bluetooth, you may want to wirelessly connect your headset this way. I use numerous types of headsets for different purposes. My main headset is a standard earbud style unit with a microphone and multi-function control button. This unit allows me to listen to audio and take phone calls. Using the button, I can start and stop audio playback and end calls. In addition to my main earbuds, I also use noise canceling headphones, which are useful when traveling. I also use a set of wireless Bluetooth earbuds, which are good for jogging and going to the gym. Using a headset can be particularly powerful when used in conjunction with voice over internet protocol, or VoIP. With VoIP, your phone number travels with you and you can make calls from your smartphone, which will appear to come from your desk. You can also have calls that come to your desk be routed to your smartphone and the person calling won't know the difference. So long as you have a stable connection, you could be in Hawaii and the caller wouldn't know that you're not at your desk. Used properly, VoIP is a very powerful tool that can allow people to work remotely in a seamless way that makes it seem as if they're still at their desk. When used in offices, headsets can significantly increase productivity. During my time in legal practice, I always worked with assistants who used wireless headsets with our office telephone system. They reported that the headsets were invaluable to them as it allowed their hands to be free while they were on the phone and kept them from feeling that they needed to stay at their desk for fear of missing calls. As someone who managed an office, I appreciated how headsets allowed my staff to multitask and feel more at ease. If you've never used a headset before, I highly recommend that you consider how using one might benefit you. If you're already using a headset, I hope that you'll consider whether you could gain from trying additional models with different features. For me, the freedom that headsets have given me and the power to absorb information has been invaluable. Before becoming a lawyer, using a headset helped me study, earn great grades, and pass the bar exam. Since becoming a lawyer, using a headset helps me manage my calls, do work on the go, and memorize information when I need to commit things to memory. Although they're small pieces of equipment, headsets can come in very handy and provide big benefits to how you work.
fingerprint reader is a small biometric scanner which is used to authenticate access to a computer system. It can be used on a desktop computer, laptop, or smartphone to unlock the device and provide access at the touch of a finger. Fingerprint readers play the simple function of unlocking a device once they detect that the correct person has swiped their finger. In this lesson, I'll show you how I use fingerprint readers to improve how I manage my electronic devices. How many times a day do you lock and unlock your devices, your computer and phone? Depending on your settings, you may be anywhere between not locking and unlocking them at all to locking and unlocking them all the time. If you're like me, you likely lock and unlock your devices many times throughout the day. What would happen if you could unlock your devices more quickly and securely? You'd likely be able to start and resume work faster, be more prone to keeping your devices locked, and have a secure system. Fingerprint readers now come standard on many devices, including laptops and smartphones. They allow for quick, easy, and secure access to devices. For computers that don't have built-in fingerprint readers, external ones like these are available and can be installed by USB. There are a few simple advantages to using a fingerprint reader. It's faster and easier to gain access to a computer by swiping a finger than by typing a password. It's also more secure than other types of biometric technology. Only the authorized user's fingerprint can unlock a device using a fingerprint reader. Conversely, anyone can type a password into a device if they can get their hands on it. Using a fingerprint reader promotes greater security by encouraging more frequent locking of devices, even if the device will be unattended only for a short period of time. In general, fingerprint readers offer great value. They're inexpensive and come standard with many devices. A USB fingerprint reader costs approximately $30. I use multiple computers to do my work. One of my computers came with an onboard fingerprint reader, but two did not. For about $60, I was able to add USB fingerprint readers to my computers. When I plugged them in, they worked immediately with the operating system. All I had to do was follow the instructions and swipe my finger until the system had enough images of my fingerprint to identify me. Although I enjoy how fingerprint readers have made my computers more secure and easier to access, I have a few warnings to make. It's important that you never be completely dependent on a fingerprint reader and that you store your password in a secure location which you can access. You may need it if there's ever an error with the fingerprint reader, if the fingerprint reader unit is ever lost, if an update occurs and your system no longer recognizes your fingerprint, or if you need to access a different part of your computer or network which requires your password. Also, a fingerprint reader is not a complete replacement for passwords on your computer. You'll still need typed passwords for many systems and online services. To get started with a fingerprint reader, all you really need is the unit, your computer, and a finger. Most modern operating systems support fingerprint readers right out of the box. When used in offices, fingerprint readers can be used as part of an office-wide security policy and to promote people to lock their computers when they are unattended, even for short periods of time. I personally use my fingerprint reader countless times every day to unlock my computers and phone. If you haven't tried using a fingerprint reader before, I hope that you'll consider whether using one might be beneficial to you. While fingerprint readers aren't the biggest tool in my hardware toolkit, they provide a small benefit in time saving and enhanced security that I enjoy on a daily basis.